<laughs> Sorry about that. This is 52 Weeks Live and uh, 52 Weeks of Design Live. And I am Alexa Hampton. And today we are going to speak to the amazing Artemis. Hello. There you are in your aubergine. Yes, and I have a Diet Coke in your honor waiting and to drink. I, I, yeah, my, I think a, a child stole mine, so I'm having to Diet Coffee, I mean, iced coffee it. How are you? I'm terrific. It's such a gorgeous day here in the city, isn't it? It's such a gorgeous day. It's the kind of day that I would like to take to speak to you. <laughs> Fancy that. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are. So we always start at the beginning. I want to know how you got on this path because you, you're all obviously all in. I, I am all in. You are you're all in. 100%. Alexa, I think you are probably similar to me in following your gut and following wanderlust. <laughs> I'm like, my gut can only be followed. It pursues me <laughs> everywhere I go. <laughs> and yes. it, it all started, I mean, we're really going back to the beginning. So I majored in Latin in college just so I could yeah. go to Rome for a semester to, to study, uh, which I did my... Oh, oh, and it was, it was, um, you know, and I, I grew up in Ohio, um, hadn't, um, I had gone to Scotland, but I hadn't traveled that much. And it just, um, it just opened up the world to me to be in the middle of Europe and wrote this ancient civilization and to see, you know, you really appreciate how young America is, you know, um, and just the, the layers that we don't have that, uh, that, the rest of the world does have is older civilizations. And so then I, I go back to Oberlin in Ohio, which is where I was studying, and my senior Great year, school. I knew I wasn't going to do anything with Latin. I mean, it's it's really, it was a like- Well, training. vocabulary. <laughs> that's true, that you. crossword puzzles, yeah. you know, that's, that's about it. Um, but even then, like on Friday, you can call this 1-800 number to get clues when you're stumped. And I'm so lazy, <laughs> I would just, you know, just call the, the 1-800 number. But uh, my senior year, I just knew I needed to go to Paris. And so I, um, worked as an au pair for some family friends in the 16th r and Mall, which is like Paris's Upper East Side. And basically I would go dancing every night and I was very studious and, you know, in student senate and everything at yeah. college, I never partied. So I would go out dancing every night and then I would sleep, I'm a big sleeper until like 1 p.m. And then I pick up the kids at three and, you know, make them dinner and bathe them and help them with their homework. And I did that. Um, and do you speak French? It's gone. It's totally gone. And I think Not that's gone. why I studied Latin is I don't have the ear for it. For I wish I could. Do you speak languages? I speak um, French, but shitty French. Yeah, me, I'm right there with you. So I can go to Paris and order and talk to taxi drivers, but I can't, yes. everything is in the present tense. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing uh, is very, very, very simple vocabulary. It's one of my huge regrets, um, yeah. actually. But uh, so I was there and um, Astrid, the little girl I was looking after was in ballet class and I was reading the International Herald Tribune. And there was an advertisement for Sotheby's Institute of Art in London, their works of art program. And again, it was, you know. You froze. And not just froze. You fr okay. There, somebody called you, didn't they? No, my, um, God, this is so tedious. My cell phone keeps going black after so many seconds of not touching it. So I'll just keep touching the screen. <laughs> it's just like, man, man, <laughs> touch on your you. phone. Touch you I titles. dropped mine into my cup today. So it's in a bowl of rice as we speak. 
Oh, oh God. So um, Astrid Sotheby's. Yeah. Sotheby's. So I just knew that was what I needed to do. And so I went over, I, you know, took the, the channel over to, um, for an interview with Sotheby's Institute and then started the, the, their graduate study program in the fall. And it's a very different type of um, art history degree than a, a traditional American art history uh, program and that it's all about connoisseurship. It's about sure. it's object based. It's less about the social history, and it was very much about the English country house taste, um, going back from the 16th century onwards. Um, and so, you know, the kind of old masters that they liked, and uh, the kind of English and French furniture that the English country houses liked. Mm -hmm. And so obviously I fell in love with that, that style. But and were you originally a Francophile or you were just in Paris? That's it. I think, yeah, I think, I, you know, I didn't know enough to know what, because I remember I spent a summer in the Loire. Um, there's an uh, organization called Friends, Friends of Yale Maison Française. And I did sort of an internship living with a family and cataloging their library. And I remember at dinner, the, the father of the family said, what is your favorite style? Um, and this is something you grow up knowing in France. And I said, Louis XIV. And I didn't even know what that meant. And everybody at the table was like, oh, really? You know, because it's quite <laughs> ponderous and and that they all had an opinion and of yes. course in your questionnaire I, I answered neoclassical so it would definitely be like late you know late uh louis says um directoire you know yes. i find that much lighter more friendly. i think you and i are in a very happy symbiotic place together we could share a house for sure. we could share a house exactly um so yeah so so i didn't know enough to be a francophile but one of the things the second year i was in paris as a nanny and this was more full-time i couldn't go dancing um till till 2 a.m every night anymore because i had to be up at 7 a.m I, I would like to tell you though when i was 16 i lived with a family in versailles and a friend of mine and i got to see run dmc and the beastie boys at the Rex. Yeah. So, oh my God. I hear you. I, oh like, my God. These are th these these summers or whatever you're spending there, are, I'm sure just indelibly etched in your memory. They are. They're formative. They really are. And I do think it's the biggest piece of advice you can give any student is to travel and yeah. see. You need to see rooms firsthand. I mean, you have been so. I mean, you've told me how your father would take I had you. no idea how fortunate I was at the time. You know, You're like was, Chateau Grousset, yeah, or, yeah. you know. Our, our feet were bleeding and we were wearing itchy smock dresses and getting car sick. That was pretty much how we, you know, we, we had a dim view of it while it was happening. Which is so, such the case if you only knew now what if you only knew then what you know now. Yeah. But uh, but but you have to agree. There's no and I know you're an avid traveler. There's no yeah. substitute for seeing it in person. Well, I hate saying that because it's so um, undemocratic. You know, like thank God we have the internet. But yeah, That's true. it's it's in terms of fantasies and what we do and atmosphere and design and surrounding yourself with it. Of course, the, the dream, the goal is always to travel, for sure. But you know what? I mean, when I traveled as a student and I had no money at all, and maybe I'm just eating a big lunch and just a tuna fish sandwich for dinner, it's worth it. And staying at totally. weird little pensions, totally. you know, sleeping like, on your purse. Yeah. At a, like, at a hostel. <laughs> yeah. And actually you'll, as you, one gets older, like you'll treasure those memories, even, you know, uh, if you woke up with fleas, but you know, I mean, I just think if you really, and it's so much easier to do it when you're younger to kind of just, you know, I mean, I could to never, be flexible. Back, but to be flexible. Um, and I just think, anyway, I think, however you're able to do it, like instead of spending money on a pair of incredible shoes, get a plane ticket. I mean, now it's COVID, yeah. but you know. Right, 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 right. Oh, I totally get it. And and I, I um, it's taken me a long time to get to that because we live in such a material world, you and I and people in design, yes. that um, I always wanted the thing. You know, I wanted to spend my money on the thing and have it forever. And then obviously the older I've gotten, the more I realize how experiential uh, 
expenses are just as treasurable. That, absolutely. And I think another thing, I'm just going haywire here. Um, I think another thing that happens as one gets older is we experience time differently and that it just, you know, as when we're young, a day feels like 52 hours and now it's, it feels like 30 seconds. And yeah. that connects with, I think, appreciating gardens more because when you're younger, gardens seem so tedious and it takes forever for things to change. But I, I think that's part of the progression too, is, is loving the, you know, gardens and cultivating um, that it, in addition to it, treasuring experiences more, um, but that's very, that's very cool. That's a very cool observation. Um, but back to what you were saying about wanting the thing, I think that is such a timely, I mean, I think we all want the thing. I mean, or maybe we're things people, uh, and not everybody's a things person, mm -hmm. but for me, and I know it was like this for Mario, I think it's like this for you, like, a thing can is imbued with memory it you know it isn't just yeah. a thing it's it's a moment um it's yeah it's harry potter when when you see the horcruxes they rang true they're imbued with soul yeah let me it, reduce it, everything to harry potter may i <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so, souvenirs of the Grand Tour. Yes, it's, souvenirs it's, of the Grand Tour. You're not biting into the Madeleine. You're looking at the whatever and holding it, and it's it's transporting you to that that it's, moment. It's a talisman. It, it's a talisman, and I inherit. So my family um, is super emotionally distant. We're not, you know, we're very, we're, we're you know, we're very waspy where we don't, <laughs> you know. I mean, my mother isn't that way, but my extended family. And I have a little marble box that belonged to my great grandparents. And it's from the 1930s and it has their name etched on the back of it. And um, it broke uh, and it could be repaired, but my husband found me like curled up in the bathroom sobbing because this little marble box had broken, which is ridiculous, you know? I mean, it's sort of like to be so um, overwrought over an object, but it definitely was revealing to, to myself about how and not everybody gets so worked up about things. I think the longer a person sells things, the less attached to them. Yeah, it's very helpful get. to have um, a flow. You, you, can, you can appreciate that it's yours for a time. Yes, yes, that, that, that's true. And I do, I mean, working on Mario's estate where he was somebody. Well, thank you so much. What you did for oh. the world of design with Henri Samuel, with Madeline, with Mario. Um, and you and I were talking about this the other day. Certainly Mario and Henri, you know, where would we be had those books not been written? You know, and it's inc like Henri's, Henri's family was so grateful that, I had, you know, and we were capturing people, you know, people were dying in the middle of our interview. I mean, <laughs> really, uh, I thought I had a bad effect on talking. We have a very intense yeah. technique. <laughs> but, you know, we would interview them and a month later they would be dead. And it was sort of just capturing these people before they disappear. And, and a lot I, of the projects were already gone. And it's like the pre-digital world of Henri Samuel, even up to my father, like, you know, if we, those, they're, they're, you know, they just won't live in memory the way the post-digital world will. On the other hand, the great thing, is, I mean, the, the upside of people dying is that they have auctions and we get to see pictures yeah. of their, you know, like the Aga Ka or the, a yeah, member yeah. of that there's a Christie sale and we're finally seeing pictures of the decoration that Henri Samuel did. And as it was for your father, so many, and you, so many of these clients are super, super private and you never, you know, it's a rare glimpse of seeing. And getting more private. private. Um, my Is that used right? to say he couldn't believe that these fabulous people would let themselves be photographed in magazines as they used to. And now, uh -huh, no way. That is so, isn't that wild as social media? I, you're blowing my mind. I'm surprised to hear that um, because it, it seems that everybody thinks of themselves as a personal brand, but uh, but but then you don't own anything anymore. And, and these people probably are aware of how important privacy is um, yeah. and guard it. Yeah. And security. 
and insurance and taxes and all kinds of things. Well, um, this is a huge thing in France. And um, Jim Ivory, uh, a merchant in Ivory, who oh, he bought Madeleine Castang's apartment after she died. And he told me how it was photographed for a magazine. And somebody, after it was published, somebody hopped in through the window and stole, um, stole a bench and left. And it was so clear that- Can I just say, I love the French that they're burglars <laughs> steal benches. <laughs> it's like they they give the picture to the thief. Okay, I want that. You know, yes. I need that, that by next uh, Thursday. Uh, Berger was stolen. <laughs> but I think. But you're right. I mean, it's it, that is that is something that people need to be thinking about. Putting it out there, you're really putting maybe ch being coming a target. Yeah. Hmm. So, so I know we we went off there for a minute. So you land at the Sotheby's program. Yes. And that program is a year long, two years long? How long is it? It was a year long and it's one of the oldest courses that they teach. Um, you probably have friends who have done it. It was started in 1968 or 69 as the works of art course. And essentially, if you wanted to become an expert at the auction house, this was the course you took before you then went off to train in a department. Uh, and so I did that for a year and they also, you can also do it with a master's thesis and so i later went back and wrote the thesis because i realized why not have the you know like that's so silly to not to not get the degree um i didn't get my degree i left uh, the institute of fine arts before getting my degree <sighs> well but you you know but you did all the work you know no, I, I mean you I oh. <laughs> anyway, so so you how um when you graduated from that program how long before you went back and did your master's I so I so I I came to New York when the program finished and I had fallen in love with English antiques and I worked for a dealer in New York City and I think it was maybe a year later and then I I went okay. back to my advisor and said could I do it part time from New York uh, and I had actually, um, I used the collection of a New York house museum, the Merchant's House Museum on East 4th yeah. Street as the basis of my thesis. Bringing you back to Merchant and Ivory. Yeah, oh, <laughs> a, a, a recurring, a light motif, who knew? Exactly. Um, yeah, and the thing about the Sotheby's program is that it really, uh, it taught me how to look or how to see and the whole thing about developing and training your eye, um, you know, that wasn't, it's not, you know, having a Latin background, you know, that I, I had taken art history courses, but it was, it, it was so important. And one of the big exercises they would have us do is we would go to the Victorian Albert once a week and we would have to describe furniture and basically learn the vocabulary of yeah. the different moldings and even just how to arrange verbally how to describe something um we re made you see it more you know made you totally it just it, it became more um technicolor and i've taught um his furniture history classes at fit and new york school of interior design and that's one of the exercises i'll do is i'll put a slide on the screen and half the class like half the class is out smoking or whatever and then well not anymore but uh <laughs> <laughs> vaping <Really? laughs> um and they're just shooting up outside <laughs> As one does. Um, and, you know, so half the class will write a description and then the other half has to draw it, like what they're yeah. writing. And it's oh, such... so cool. It, and, you know, designer, I mean, I often hear designers are saying, well, it's all about the sketch on the cocktail napkin, you know, to show a client what you're talking about. And I can't sketch at all. So for me, it's words. But what do you, for you to describe to a client or to have them envision something, is it verbal or is it visual? Um, both. Um, but first it must be verbal because my, my talent is on, is not on tap. So some days I can really draw and some days I really can't. Right. Um, and also I think that's a kind of a coy thing, like on the napkin that makes it so offhand. Yes. Um, but to, to be able to speak something I think is to respect it and to, um, also validate the, the professions that surround the thing because if you can't describe it, then how can you have somebody acknowledge its value? Mm. You know, if you just say it's a chair and they say, well, what about it? 
and you're like, right. it's a chair, then you've robbed it of any value, of any context, of any history, of any, you know, connoisseurship. You've just like, you know, you're talking is important. Oh my gosh. And it's like, there's no such thing as just a chair. It's a, a microcosm of a moment in time. I mean, it's a whole, yeah. it's a whole I thing. I mean, you've got your platonic ideal of what is a chair. You know, you, you see it, it's got three legs, but you still know it's a chair because it has its essential chairishness. But yeah, you have to, yeah. I, I mean, and, the, and you are obviously so fluent in this language. It is so amazing. Well, back at you, sister. Uh, <laughs> but you're also speaking to how it's not just a chair, but it's not just a room. Um, you know, I think both of us, um, we, th there's that, the atmosphere. There's, you know, when, when we study rooms or like you create rooms, you want it to be more than just the sum of the furnishings, don't for you? Sure. For sure. Um, and 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 it's achievable. I mean, you see people achieving it, and that, you know, as I was talking about how furniture, you know, where I worked for um, High Park Antiques, who specializes in English um, uh, antique furniture, and I realized after Bernie. I worked there for, for Bernie, Bernie Carr, that's Bernie. right, and Rachel, um, I worked there for ten years, and I realized it wasn't just the furniture that I was passionate about; it was the whole setting, the whole uh, whether it's the original Regency drawing room that they would have been created for, or how they are mixed into rooms in the nineteenth and twentieth, now twenty first centuries, um, and so that was that sort of sent me on a, on a new trajectory and, and diving into these book, these design history books that I've been so writing. So when, when, which was your first? My first one was actually for Hyde Park. Um, they were the celebrating. English one? Uh, it was, um, it was, it was classic English design and antiques. Yes. And it was to celebrate their collection over their many decades. But I was, um, so they, they, they let me write it and they were so generous to let me weave a story and to sort of, it was sort of the book I had wish I had had when I was studying 18th century furniture. Um, and so it goes through the styles and Rizzoli published it. And um, so since then I've, I've worked only with Rizzoli um, and they said, well, what's, would you like to do another book? And I pitched yeah. Regency Redux. Which I... Love and half. I've got all of your books together in a section. Um, so, it, so Regency Redux. Um, part of the well, when I was when when I had the germ of the idea, Kelly, because I'm always thinking like, why why should we care about this book now? And even if you want history to be objective, you're bringing your the lens of today. I mean, you just can't get away from yourself. Um, so it's there's always going to be that filter. And so when I was working on it, Kelly Wurstler was doing her The Viceroy. Um, Jonathan Adler was sort of copying a lot of, you know, Regency, but, but 1980s reviving. versions. Reviving. Reviving and celebrating. That's true. Everything's an interpretation and everything does have its As own As a spin devoted on. reviver and celebrator, that's why I make the distinction. You know, you're 100%. You're absolutely right. Um, and so... And then what was blowing my mind is, you know, I was start, I was teaching some design history courses and I bumped into, oh my God, this horrible person I went to college with. I bumped into him at an LA party and he was an architect and he had never heard the style term Regency. And it's like, how- Wait, what school are, did you go to? I know. A sign, he, some California, I know. And it was like, what the hell like is the going Disney on? Disney School of Architecture? I don't think I that. know. Oh, and okay, I know this is, nobody cares about this story, but my first, <laughs> I do. Sem my first semester at Oberlin, which is super progressive, I lived in a co-op where you cook and clean it yourself, everybody living there. Mm -hmm. And it was not a good group of people to be right. looking after themselves. And Jim and John, they left a gallon of milk in their room over spring break and the whole, and it just, you know, with the heat oh. on, why am I telling you this? <sighs> anyway, so he was the one who didn't know what Regency was, though. So, so, so like he's a, just a boob. He's a boob. Day. He's a total he's a boob. boob. 
But it, it really, um, you really see that the story, the story that people are taught of the 20th century in design schools is about modernism and the emergence of modernism. And, and that's true of the, the fine arts as well. It's is about that true? abstract and- The new movements. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that's just like a, a, you know, that's a moment in the timeline. Like it'll come back around, but for the for the reviewable past, I think that that is the case. Even like I would take a painting class at RISD, and it felt like a person doing representational art, and I felt I felt like a total loser. Like, and so I, I see that. You see that and you experience that. Um, and, it's, and but if you look at the old issues of Vogue and, you know, House and Garden or House Beautiful from like the 1920s and 30s and 40s, that is not how people were living. They were living in a much more um, traditional or eclectic sort of style. And they were having firms like Macmillan, um, you know, create Rose Cumming or, you know, um, Ruby Ross Wood create rooms for them that were very much, if I not- I guess Dorothy the, Draper would be the closest. Right, I mean, to being a little bit more modern. Less. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and so it's sort of like these people, these names aren't even known, you know, I mean, it really, I mean, of course to us, we know them so well, but that they're being, I guess it, it just really struck me the difference between the what the canon of style, the official canon of style being taught was and what people's real taste was. Um, and it's that story about Le Corbusier creating, you know, that um, development for workers and like within a, a, a month or whatever, they had, they had sort totally like larded it up with, you know, um, accessories and, oh, Fred is joining us. I don't know if you can see his ears. Um, I can't. <laughs> Not yet. Um, so, you know, like the, the, people want ornament, people want decoration, people want things. Um, it, it's really tough living in a modernist. Yeah, segment. my father always felt that it was very incompatible with, with um, I mean, he loved it and he did it in his early career, but he felt that ultimately it was incompatible with life. You know, where do you put the paper? Where do you put the Christmas present? Where do your kids put their toys? Um, that it, right. it required a, a dedication and a rigor that a lot of people weren't willing to to uh, devote to it. I, I, absolutely, I am not that disciplined person. You know, I, you read Fountainhead, uh, the Fountainhead, like I could never be Howard Rowe or yeah. um, it's just, no, I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so. So where are you living? Well, you're living in New York then this whole time. Yeah. Oh, yes, this whole time. And, um, and I think it's something growing up in the Midwest, you, if, if, if it doesn't sing to you, um, you know you're going to end up in New York. Uh, I, and that's something I always knew I would inevitably be here. And I don't know how to drive, for example. So now I'm sort of, you know, I can't leave even if I wanted to. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we're, um, we, we had a huge move, as you, as you know, um, during COVID. And COVID has been, I think people have made so many changes in their life um, during this very interesting period. It's really made people think. And we were living in Brooklyn Heights, where we had been for 14 years. And um, we actually had just put an offer on a country house in, Litch in, in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And the next day um, I got a call from the, the, the realtor who looks after the building where my little gallery office space is in the village saying- And how long have you had that? Uh, five, when I turned 40, so five, six years ago, 5.8 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet, I'm not 46 yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and they said this adjoining apartment is available. And it was such a weird time. It was July. Um, we, you know, if you were here in the city, you could hear helicopters overhead all the time. Uh, there were protests in the streets. 
we were still nervous, you know, we knew a little bit more about COVID, but it was a weird moment. And it was like, do we want to, do we want to move into the city and make this big move? Um, and we're like, yeah, you know, like we, we know New York is resilient. If you've been here through September 11, like sure. you have, the city bounces back. It, don't you think it's already bouncing back? Oh yeah, back. yeah, totally. I, de- I, I mean, it, it has never been a static entity ever. I mean, 70s, 80s, 90s, odds, teens, you know, it, it, there's different guys to it. You know, at one time people are lamenting the, the dirt, then they lament the lack of dirt, then they lament, you know, Disney on 57th, then yeah. they lament the closing of Disney on, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly evolving. And, you know, when I was um, studying the Greek revival period in New York, when I was working on my master's thesis, oh, one, one of the things you understand about what is so special about New York is New York has always been about money. It's all like that. It's always been about commerce as opposed to Boston or Philadelphia. And so, I, you know, I kind of, I'm sure, I'm sure that's right, but I prefer to consider it about industry. Okay, industry, or an enterprise, you yeah. know, it's a very entrepre- yeah. entrepreneurial city. And so just in terms of our architectural heritage, we have all, we have not preserved as much because it has been about revolution, you know, tearing yeah. things down, evolu- yeah, it's, it, building new things and uh, moving with the times. And there's that energy of that forward moving energy that just rips through the city. Um, and so one, I mean, one side of that is that we have a few pockets in the city where we still have our heritage of the early city, but, you know, but we do have so many skyscrapers and the skyline is always changing. And now we have the needle buildings and, you know, and, and everybody complains about that, but it's just the next thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, yeah, just yeah, the totally. new stage. So you're, what made you oh. open the gallery? Um, so I, it was never a dream I had. I never And where to... were you in the writing of your books when you did it? So I reached the 10 year anniversary of working at um, the gallery, the, the Hyde Park Antiques, and I just knew it's time, I need a change. It's time for a new chapter. And I didn't quite know what that was, but I thought, oh, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna, you know, and, I, that's what I'm going to do. And it was right at that moment where blogging was kind of destroying um, the, the, right, the, the appreciation of writing and journalism. I know that sounds really bleak, but it just, you know, and I think that is something that is still going on, that words are cheap, you know, that, um, and, and really we're such... And now grammatically incorrect as well. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I, they're just we've really become a much more visual culture where we are we're mo- more emoji than right, right. than letters um so so that was sort of like oh that's not gonna work you know like i can still write but i'm gonna keep writing for pleasure um and for you know that's what that's gonna be that is not going to be a professional thing for me and there's so many other brilliant journalists who as magazines and newspapers have folded, they're out in the world and I don't need, you know, like I'm not gonna compete with them. Um, So then I went back to what I have, my expertise um, in in antiques and, you know, in design. And so that's what I started to build and working with private clients. And I realized I needed a space to show things or to have meetings. And so it was so, it was really just that Um, I found what's my pink room downstairs uh, in the New York Times, you know, in a real estate listing. And it was just the perfect location. 10th Street, as you know, has so many wonderful dealers who I admire and I'm a block away from them. And and then it was like, well, now I have four walls. What am I, what am I gonna do with the four walls? And so I started having little shows in my, you know, my little shoe box of a room. Uh, and so getting the call over the summer to, to sort of expand the gallery because it's now I have two floors and it's yeah. live work, which is a great discipline for me to be vacuuming and you know making sure it's ready. Good thing for Jim to and see. John aren't there, <laughs> right? Exactly, <laughs> they're gallons of milk. Um, 
And um, it now, and, and uh, we have the parlor floor of this 1838 Greek Revival townhouse. So the green back parlor has 13 foot high ceilings and it's perfectly proportioned. And it's exciting to be able to show things, you know, to really show things in a better yeah. way. Uh, and now I sort of, I'm working on a book right now about uh, a second book on Mario Guada, but I kind of, one of the things having a space I've realized is I don't need to write a book about everything. I could just do a show. You yeah. know, I can just. I say back to what you were saying about language versus the visual. Exactly. And one of the first little shows I did was an homage to Bunny Mellon, and I just became obsessed with her. And it wasn't, you know, and I, I had a few things that were loaned to me that had belonged to her, uh, but it was really an evocation of her spirit. And so I dove in and um, uh, Bruce Budd, who worked with her, gave me her iced tea recipe. Oh, Bruce Budd. He is such, he's so delightful, isn't he? And so talented. Oh, I'm, I'm just talking about his talent. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about the time. Yeah, he's really a, a, such an incredible eye, so curated. Yeah. Um, so he gave me her iced tea recipe, so I, which has a lots of um, grain alcohol, orange juice. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's non-alcoholic. Oh no! And then he also gave me her. Um, her daiquiri recipe. So I made that for the opening party. Um, I was just so like great. squeezing lemons and oranges for, for days in preparation. And then Bruce also told me how she would have a scented candle, but it would be outside the room. So you would smell it as you went into the room. Right. Um, and I just, you know, and it's so it heralded it. your entry. Yes. Uh, so I love, like I want, that it, it's so fun to do and then it's sort of like okay i had my bunny melon summer now on to the next thing um something uh having just been at your gallery last week the week before yeah last week ever um is that unlike a hyde park or a place where you go knowing that you're going to get a specific thing this is just a deep dive into whatever you're in the mood <laughs> no but i mean i love that because as a, a fan of your interests, um, going in and seeing what is, that's actually like a really trend setting thing. Not that you want to set trends. I mean, this is just what you like, but it's great to see your revival of the painted silk of, or your um, Pierre exhibit, Pierre Bergeon, um, or whatever. Like, it's just so cool because it is, back to experiential you get to come in and experience whatever it is you're in the mood to, it's it's a it's a museum it's a it's a it's very it's very cool and it's very specific I, and it's I not so that lucky um i mean sometimes you know i just it just you know like like we, i was saying before it's just what is speaking to me and i just i have to do it and you know there's definitely that moment before it opens and you're like fuck does any is anybody gonna come you know is am I, I feel before any party yeah you know yeah and you're sort of like am i alone out here on this precipice or are other people going to come along like you just never know what the reaction is going to be yeah. um and so it's so wonderful when people do want to come along with you yeah. and are excited about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Will you, do you think you'll ever, like if you got the next floor, would you do it? Oh my God. I can't believe you said that. The woman who lives above bought Kenneth J. Lane's apartment. So she's moving out in a year. Well, have you I didn't it? even think about that. Maybe I should take it. I mean, this is just the, these are the, you know, you, that would be step three. Oh my God. Oh my God, you have to. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I wish. It didn't even occur to me. I was thinking this, like, oh, a friend should had, go take um, it. Had seen, had seen it, like with the garden and everything. It's just. It's really, and one of the it, things. It's the closest to a sewn experience in New York City. What? That's right. Well, I wanted, because I, if, if I was just living here, it definitely would look different. You know, it wouldn't, you know, as you know, the, the, there's the interior staircase and it's painted emerald green and with this Christian Berard like decoration by Halle yeah. Atabegi. Um, like, I don't know if I would do that if it was just me here. It might, you know, but I wanted, I was thinking about, I want people to have an experience. You know, I want it to be fun. I want it 
I, I want it to be memorable. I, mean, I kind of felt like Eloise going in there. Well, you know, to get anybody to show up for anything, they deserve a glass of champagne or a lollipop, you know? Like people, <laughs> like that, it's, it's yeah. anytime somebody comes to the drawer, it is such a compliment. And I'm so grateful for that, for somebody taking their time out to do. And one of the things that's been amazing to see is people really reacting to the color. Because as you know, every single room is a super saturated color. Yeah. And a few people- Would you like to give us a little look-see around the, I don't know, um, oh. if you have a barfing cat near you at the moment. <laughs> oh yeah, can you see him? He's yeah. sort of like, um, yeah, um, should when I- When I was I... over there, Emily was like, oh, he just threw up everywhere. And I was not at all upset. Um, okay, I'm gonna take you on a little tour. Let's so the living room, which is our private room and nothing's for sale, is an homage to Mario. Uh, and I had Mario's painter uh, who worked on the Ross's apartment, his last job, do these aubergine walls. And I'm going to take you in really close. Can you see how they're sort of uh, yeah. speckled? So it's, it's supposed to look like porphyry. It does. It looks like Swedish porphyry. I love it. Um, OK. And there's Fred. Hi, okay. So Is Fred the one I got down on the ground? Oh, I don't, or did, that's no. Hugo. It was Fred. Okay, yeah, Fred. Um, and then, okay, so this is the green salon. I'm actually, this is all the Mario Buada archives yeah. that I'm going through right now. And we're getting ready for the George and Lucinda show. So I just brought in these sofas that Amazing. are gonna have and look at those them. paintings. Yes, those are by uh, Peggy Kennedy, who uh, is an incredible artist, but she started off as a magazine editor. And she actually, before she was an editor, she worked with Horst on his sittings. Mm -hmm. And she said he liked how she did flowers. So, and then um, these Austrian shades are inspired by Henri Samuel's for Susan Goodfriend. Yep. And I'll show you a little bit of the garden. And those amazing shutters. Yes, I mean, oh, it's just, it, it's such a treat to be, I mean, this room has so many sins in terms of the the walls aren't pristine and, and all of that, um, but, but just the proportions and it sort of has these Egyptian uh, revival motifs. So I'm gonna take you into the hallway. So again, this is all getting ready. We're having a big party for uh, Chris Spitzmiller's book in the garden on Tuesday, so, we're making his iced tea. He has a special mint yeah. iced tea. Oh, and then we could talk about the cheese thing. He, I asked him about hors d'oeuvres. Yeah. And, and he said, oh, I love pimento cheese hors d'oeuvres. And I said, if you know me at all, I am not serving cheese. It's a texture What's a pimento thing. thing? What, what do you have against cheese? It's, um, yeah, I think that the, I like melted cheese, but unmelted cheese, it's since I was a little girl, I, I just think it's really, it just is gross. Um, and then you can see there's maybe it was the Jim and John milk. Yeah, I that. <laughs> oh my god, I mean, cheese okay. is my most beloved, you know, it's family and cheese, really. But yes, I, I do prefer melted to other things. Oh, melt is the best. So then this is the pink room. And this is uh, this is going to be in the Lucinda and George show. It's upside down. Wow. But it's a garden. It's a trompe l'oeil garden trophy. And George, her, wow. her father, ha did one similar for Bunny Mellon back in, in the day. I love that. And then when you come in, you come into this mirrored wallpaper room with all these Tug Rice drawings uh, that he does, or prints that he does for us. Yeah. So lots, lots of color. It's so much fun. Okay, I'm coming back to you. And you look, you look wonderful in all of these rooms. <laughs> it, pink is so flattering. Oh, and in my bathroom, which is like Studio 54, I have one of your ceiling light fixtures. Yay! Uh, from Google uh, Comfort. It's so, it has- I can't see your face. Oh. Thank you. Um, it has, it's like this Moroccan kind of inspired one that you did, um, kind of like a lobed quatrefoil. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. Um, people are saying they want us, somebody said they want us to go to India with, to see them, which I'm totally okay with. And everybody's loving seeing this tour and how cool it is. Oh, it good. Really, 
it's bold. It's really bold. And I wonder if, you know, you said if you didn't, if you only lived there and wasn't uh, using it in the capacity that you're using it in, you wouldn't paint it like this. But I'm so glad you did because you get to dip your toe in this and you do get to live with it for a certain amount of time as long as you feel like it. And like, it's a ch it's another chapter. And I, it's another, it's totally another chapter until I get that third floor. Oh my God. What a, you I have to. I have to tent one of those rooms. Um, you know, color just fills me with joy. It's something, um, you know, I do, my whole family battles with a little bit of depression and I've always found color just, it just helps my mood so yes. much. Um, yeah, it really does. And also I went to a friend's apartment. I hope he doesn't mind my saying this and he has wonderful things and he's a young collector artist. And, you know, it was like, you have to paint your, your part. These white walls are making your things look sad. Yeah. You know, they're, they're bringing them down. And so I convinced him to paint the walls a like cantaloupe orange and it's electric. It's yeah. I mean, everything is just has a new life to it. And I mean, I guess that's my one lesson to the world is paint your walls, you paint know, your walls. Paint your when walls. I first went to the court hold and saw the, that collection with my parents, it had just received a paint job. And, um, at the time, you know, it's, uh, it's electric Eau de Neal. Oh, and at God. the time I Love thought, that. why did they pick this color? It, especially with the impressionist paintings. I thought this is, this is fighting and, I don't get it. And now, of course, I mean, I, I don't know how old I, I must have been in my late teens or 20 or something when, when I thought that. Um, and now, of course, I'm like, damn, oh, Daniil, so smart of them. Oh, that color is so haunting. I mean, I think that was one of the things that attracted me to Madeleine Castang's work is that she has that oh, kind yeah. of turquoise, arsenic, turquoise. Yes. That's what is that? Sorry. <laughs> I've been petting him this whole time. Oh He's just God. napping on my lap. He's like a little Wookie. Oh, Hershey. Oh, what a honey bunny. Um, oh. but uh, yeah, he is like a Wookie. He's a tiny, tiny little Wookie. Um, but yeah, I I just was doing things at High Point with turquoise and black and brass, and of course, <gasps> I think Madeline Castang is just really amazing. And she is. So she's somebody. so badass. So badass. Like and you and your red gloves. My homage to her. You know, what I took away after working on that book is that she maybe was a narcissist. She maybe was a little bit of a monster, but she was bold. And well, she was talented. We're not, you know. Oh, and she was talented. So she, talented. Yeah, that's always an interesting question, like the personality versus the talent and how, you know, what, how do you judge that? Uh, but decisions, you know, as a woman, you know, she went into business in her 40s, you know, and she grew up privileged, but then a lot of the wealth was taken away by the Nazis when they requisitioned things, and including her country house, Lev, which she bought back with her own money after, after the war. Um, and it sort of, you know, when I got my little pink room, um, I was turning 40, and it was really... You know, it was, I didn't know if anybody, you know, like, what am I doing? You know, and yes. I've never wanted this, but it just felt like I needed to make a bold move uh, for this new decade. And, and 40 is a tricky age. I, You know, it's a moment where yeah, you're yeah. It's sort of like an about face, uh, holy crap. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I forget your answer on the question about your clothes. What did, did you say that your clothes reflect your style? Well, they're, they're, there, let's just say I'm I'm in a like a soft pants phase, so <laughs> <laughs> so I would I would like them to be a little bit more tailored to reflect my yeah. style. But I I found but I, I asked because some people I'm sure at forty per, would perhaps imbue their wardrobe with color or has some sort of fashion seismic shift. But it doesn't surprise me at all that perhaps you or I might it, it might play out on the walls of our dwelling 
Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And of course, as New Yorkers, we're, we probably are finding ourselves in black a lot or, you know, just sort of a monotone kind of thing. I'm in my Bond villain shirt today. I know. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to be you want to be a Bond girl for a long time, then you want to be Bond. And now I've gone, no, I've gone over villain. to the villain. And then after this, I will I will end up being like one of the henchmen. <laughs> like odd job or jobs. <laughs> oh my god, it's true. I did want to be. I mean, Bond girls just look so terrific, don't they? No, um, you want to be. You want to be Bond, but in the Bond girl guys, if you're a woman, right? Well, I remember when I first moved to New York um, after grad school. It was like 2000. And um, yeah, I mean, I was like wearing my Manolos all over town. I don't know how my feet were taking that. I was getting Brazilian bikini waxes. I mean, that's all over. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. done. <laughs> a soft pants space is a sign that we should have at our doors. Like, um, welcome to a soft pants space. Oh, I just had my eyebrows like threaded or whatever and the woman was like oh you have curtain bangs and curtain eyebrows <laughs> because what if i had like an eyebrow <laughs> <hair>? <laughs> but it's interesting i mean i will i i know you must feel this too that once you get over that for me at 40 was sort of like oh but once i got over it it was like you just don't you don't care what no. people think and you just become more you well that was another thing that you wrote on on your questionnaire, which was um, who said whatever people say about you is none of your business, and that yeah, is I don't want to know. I don't want to know what not, you think. I did not know that. I did not learn that lesson until I turned forty, and I can't say that I always don't want to know what people say behind my back. But it is a you know when my kids who are young um, come to me and say so and so said this about me, I'm like you know well who told you. Yeah, that's not your business. And whoever told you, you should be concerned about because they're bringing you this, this pain. Well, that's the thing. Usually, it's not going to be something wonderful that I mean, you know, mo mostly it's, I don't, I don't need anything to bring me down. And yeah, yeah. Um, something that I only recently have understood is Deanna Freeland had this attitude and who else? Oh, I think Kenneth J. Lane to uh, both you know, probably narcissists, but <laughs> why, oh, why, why does everybody get tarred by that? <laughs> you're not one. You're not and one. You're a narcissist. You're a narcissist. You're a narcissist. But just that if somebody, if there was somebody odious or just really unpleasant or nasty, they, that person just didn't exist for them anymore. And and I just think that's so healthy. Instead of giving it energy or giving that yeah, 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 yeah. negativity, you just Oxygen. put it, yeah, just put it in a, in a balloon, as my friend Harry Heisman says, and let it go away, yes. you know, let it disappear. And perhaps, um, yeah, with design, same thing. Don't keep up with the Joneses. Do you see how I'm trying to bring this back to our <laughs> conversation? <laughs> Sorry, Alexa. No, 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 no. Somebody wrote. Oh, freewheeling. I'm, I'm responding to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, comparison yeah, I think is... We, at a certain age, when we are younger, we want our rooms to speak of us kindly and to reflect upon us. Yeah. And as we get older, we mellow into being in rooms we want to have. That's right. And yeah, I, I, I think you are so right. And I, I remember Mario t telling me, and then I met the client and she told me the same story of how he uh, had a Robin's Egg Blue dining room for the client. And the curtains were like a, a fresh pea green and white or cream stripe. And the curtain hanger was like, oh, this must be, be a mistake. Why would you ever have green and blue in the same room? And then the client got super nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's sort of like it's the too many cooks in the kitchen. I mean, I'm sure you have this conversation with your clients all the time. Like, I also stop. have this conversation on 52 a lot. Like, beware the, the sister-in-law yeah exactly and it's sort of what feels right to you um and embrace it and go with it mm -hmm. and which brings us back to what you were saying about the Sotheby's class and connoisseurship versus taste and oh. you know, personal collections 
um, versus value in somebody else's life. Yeah, because connoisseurship is disappearing. And I rem I had this um, wonderful Art Deco period dining table and so a client, somebody was interested in buying it. And, you know, they're like, oh, well, there's a brand new one for the same price. And it's like, well, really, you know, you should buy the period example one. There's more value to the real yes. thing than a reproduction. And he's like, oh, you know, and, and he just had an attitude that something new was better than something, you know, something used. Uh, and that sounds like Steve Martin, in the joke, right? <laughs> like, or no, there's a line in the movie Cousins where he's like, no, it's not Cousins, where, where he's talking about like, what's all this? Old? Oh, it's gotta be Roger David Go. What's all this old wine? I want new wine. Right, I want new wine. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, I think people don't, you know, and especially having worked for 10 years and before Hyde Park, you know, I had interned with Devonish. I don't know if you remember him. Of course. And, and Partridge in London. And, you know, where Was it's Devonish on 57th? Oh. No, that was Dalva. Forget it. Oh, Dalva. Yeah, he was on Madison, and then Mallet took over his space. Right, right, right. right. Um, just that people they created this these whole worlds of opulence and grandeur, and people don't they don't really care about if it's eight seventeen ninety the real deal never been touched before or that it was owned by. I a disagree. Oh, okay. Well, I think people do care. I, I hope they do. But I hope there are still, because it does. And yeah, somebody's putting um, dollar signs and it's true. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it costs a lot more. So sometimes people just have to separate them from, from caring. But so then they cannot partake. Well, that's a good, I mean, absolutely. But I do think for some people who have, who, that isn't an issue they don't know to appreciate the difference because there is a difference you know and i think they just don't know how they don't see it and and maybe that's part of what you do is you help show them why is the 18th century one special going to bring more because i'm sure oh an earring is just flying off um I wore it for you. Um, I haven't worn earrings forever. But um, you know that it does bring, there is soul to older pieces. Um, there, which, it does, is, which is again, you have to be able to speak it. You have, and a room, when you have things of age in a room, they've mellowed, There's uh, there might be a translucent quality to the, to the wood. Um, the room changes, like it's not as hard. There's a softness, a, a depth to it. Um, and I'm sure you and I, when we go into a room, we'll feel that and appreciate that, but not everybody maybe does immediately. Well, maybe they do, but they don't articulate it, right? Right, right, um, sort of ineffable. And yeah, they don't. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what, on that, on that topic, when I went to Kyoto, Kyoto <gasps> and I realized that all of the temples I was visiting had burned to the ground and are rebuilt every, you know, like purposely, that part of the religious function was to, to get rid of it and rebuild it, hmm. my mind blew off my neck. Wow. Yeah really really crazy you're like yeah yeah okay <laughs> i don't know where to go with that i don't know well, i just was reading somebody was, it was saying that you should you should ask me about my philosophy on hanging plates so i was distracted about it because i was no, thinking no, about it. I, I, what is your philosophy on hanging plates okay i don't love it i think i mean i do love it like if you see an 18th century i mean i don't think a lot of people do it in this day and age that's true. I think that, no, that is true. I often, when I see it, because Mario loved to do it, and yeah. if people remember his dining room, it was all blue and white on an apricot ground. Uh, peach jam is the closest Benjamin Moore color, if you're interested. Um, Which I, I think is great because blue and white, I don't think, is happy with food. I mean, I know everyone has blue and white plates, but I just think the fact that no food except for the blueberry is really blue, That's that I good. don't like blue and white plates, but in that peachy context, perfect. And blue is the color to deter flies. So, I mean, I think you're right. Like that's connected, I think, to it not being an appetite stimulating awesome. kind of color. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I think if you're going to hang plates on the wall, you have to be gutsy and you can't just take like a set of teeny tiny little dessert plates and arrange them. You've got to do big platters. You've got to, you know, think outside of just round shapes. Um, and really, you know, I think you've got to do that a lot of That it's and negative space and create a composition. Right? Yeah. Create not, j yeah, just not like four plates on each side of a mirror or a little print. I think, I just think it's, it's not sad. Yeah. It doesn't do anything for me. Um, what you just described, like the four plates and a little print, I sometimes derisively call hotel decorating. Right, right. It's like you're just filling up a wall and it's, it's not really meaningful at all. Um, and maybe if you have like 50 rooms, like do it for a room and then go back to it when you can. Well, but. yeah. And the, the most successful examples of them are the ones that have like 5,000 plates, like the full that what we're talking about. And, they, and, and then, then you feel like you're in Russia and they're not even plates anymore. They're um, you're in a, a little room. stove. Yes. yes. Now we're talking. That and that would be a lesson Mario would say is, um, you know, if you're going to do a collection, get a lot of it. And it almost is like yeah. for him, he didn't even care about the condition if it was chipped or whatever, but it just feels more important if you've got a lot. I um, totally get that. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. um, though, whatever, whatever, um, whatever China I was collecting at Bardith, they told me that the Aga Khan was collecting. And I was like, oh, well, I, I, guess, I guess that's You're doing the right. water. I was okay. like, well, I'll just keep my plate. That's it. I'll keep my plate and so be it. And I, Emily, it's two. I'm not even halfway through what I want to talk to you about. Can we do a part two? Because I want to talk to you about the whole process with Mario and how you guys met and how that all went down. Oh my God, I would love it. I would, Are I would, you in? Oh my God, girl, I am because in. Because it would also be a good, well, when does your next book about Mario come out? So, oh God, my editor's probably listening. Um, it's March. Um, okay, you can say March. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to push it back a season? No, but it'll be, it's in March is uh, or March April is is, is the publish uh, publishing date. Is okay. the publishing date? Yes. Um, okay, because it will be fun to talk about that prior to its release. It would be it would be really fun, and I can I can in a There's few months problem. share you share with you some of the the layouts and stuff like that as the process. Well, speak gets to your, speak to your editors about that. I don't want to. Okay, good point. You know. Um, okay, so part two, because this has been so much fun. And, okay, as happened the other week when I showed up at your house, and I, I think, like, I just kept talking, and you had to be like, okay, goodbye, Alexa. <laughs> no, I didn't want you, to, I wanted you to move in. No, no, I think you thought I had moved in. I was on the floor. You walked in after I'd been on the floor with your cat. Um, uh, but, yeah. I, I that did happen. Titty, titty, chat, chat. No. Ah, forever. Um, well, it's been and I love your take on all of this because, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people who do what I do and that is a different, that's a different kind of thinking about it. And as a historian and historian, do you say that? Do you say an historian? Yes, of course, Alexa. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure you didn't think I was being a boob. Um, but as an historian, I enjoy your perspective because it's, it's, longer, more global. There's so much for the past to teach us. You know, we would be fools to not. Fools! Fools to not. Terrible fools. That's right. That's right. Well, it was so delightful. Part two coming. And thank you so much. So much love. And thank you for giving us the mini tour, too, because the, the house is shockingly awesome. Well, come on down. Come on down, everybody. Uh, but come on down Penn Street. It's Eerdman's. Do you pronounce it Erdman or Erdman? Erdman's. Erdman, but it's mm -hmm. a double E. Double E. new, not get it. That's right. Okay. Okay. Kisses and thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.